Well, this is a vitally important topic, and I gotta tell you, my experience anyway, is that it's seldom discussed. In fact, I actually can't think of a message I've ever heard on this particular subject specifically. But I also would say that it's one of the most important things to be covered in all of Scripture. We lack an understanding of this particular topic, and because we do, it affects how we live, how we think, and how we relate both to God and to ourselves and to others. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews for a few minutes, so one thing you need to know about the book of Hebrews is we don't know who wrote it. It was addressed to Hebrew people, and the key word in this particular book is the word better, B-E-T-T-E-R, better. The author is trying to give us a more excellent way, a better way, a new and living way. And you'll see the word better throughout the scripture in some translations. He's trying to make this transition from the Old Testament to a new way of thinking, a better way to live. Philippians is another word that has a key word in it. It's the word joy or rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Well, it's known as the book of joy. Always know, if possible, what the key word is in the book you're about to enter into. So we're talking about the word better. Now, specifically, we're looking at chapter 9, verses 12 through 14. I want to talk to you today about cleansing our consciences. Hebrews 9, 12 to 14. He did not enter, speaking of Jesus, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of Heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? You might sit there saying, what, what are you talking about? Bulls and goats and ashes, what, we, what is this about? I want to talk to you about how an important part of your life and my life can be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and no longer hinder us from living the life we are called to live. Let's break it down, shall we? He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. This blood of which we've been speaking in this series is, I don't know, when you preach on the blood or teach on the blood, you'll notice something different if you're ever in that perspective. There's something different happens when you talk about the blood of the lamb. There's a residue there, there's a power, there's an authority, there's a thoroughness, there's an eternality to what the blood has to do. There's a finality to what the blood does when applied. It is a eternal, lasting, consistent faithfulness of God. It's unlike anything you see in culture. It can be depended upon, it's always the same, it can always be applied, it never diminishes in power, it's, it has all authority, no weapon formed against it shall prosper. It is what it is, and it's divine. When you start talking and looking and praying and searching out the scripture about the blood of the lamb, you're talking about something that can be depended upon. Not uh, flip-flopping politicians or, or wayward culture or fads in society or movements in the church. This is a eternal, never-changing, powerful thing. I'm asking you to lean on and understand this morning. Eternal redemption. There is no shadow of turning in this thing. It's not, gonna, it's not an opinion. It's not a passing thought. It's a divine principle and application of the blood of Christ to all of life, every era, epoch of time, every generation, every person, every race, every tribe, every tongue. The blood of the lamb consists of this thing. That's it. We're talking about something here that is so vitally important to be applied to our life, and when it is in the power and the authority of which it was intended, will change the way you think. The blood of the lamb. He goes on to say, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. Let's get the picture. These Old Testament Israelites and some Egyptians that joined them and some Moabites that joined them and some people from other Canaanites that joined them, they all started to worship in the temple and they would bring these sacrifices to God. Their best sacrifice, their best lamb, their best goat, their best sheep, their best heifer, 
They would, they would bring these things as a substitutionary sacrifice for themselves. And it, it gave them an outwardly clean feeling. They went through a religious ritual that gave them a sense of accomplishment that now God would look at them differently. Having done what they just did, God sees them different. And perhaps on some level, perhaps they might see themselves different. Kind of like going to church on a Sunday. Maybe you do it every now and again, and you say to yourself, you know, I feel better for having gone. It's an outward satisfaction in that. Uh, an accomplished act done to make me feel different than I would have I not gone. That's the Old Testament. Now, here's the thing. If you look at this closely and give it some thought, this will mess with your head. They were outwardly clean. But yet, the author of Hebrews is saying the blood of Christ can cleanse our conscience. Let me interpret that for you. Every person you read about in the Old Testament did not have a clean conscience, for there was no blood of Christ. There was only an outward satisfaction. Aren't you glad you're living in the New Testament age? I don't know what that was like. I don't like it. I don't want it. I want at least the ability to have a clean conscience. How about you? These people didn't. Think about that, you Bible teachers and students. Everyone in that 39 books did not have a clean conscience. It's crazy. They had to do something temporary and repeatable to get themselves in right standing with God. And that's what righteousness is, right standing with God. They had to do something. They had, for the most part, a need of radical surgery, and the best they could do was a Band-Aid. That's not a good place to be. How would you like to go to the emergency room and triage, and they go, stat, this person needs to go in the operating room right away. Now nah, I forget about it, just give them a Band-Aid. That's what they had to do. They had to bring an animal for something that really they needed healing on the inside. Now I'm gonna share a story with you, and it uh, has the potential to be disgusting. But it, and it happened in our family years ago, and I haven't forgot it because it was disgusting. And it has a lesson to it. And I'm not gonna name one of our, which one of our children it was, or male or female, but one of our children, when they, were, had a, when they had a baby, had this issue on their tummy. We had to take them to the doctor to get it taken care of. Well, anyway, long story short, it left a cavity, a little cavity inside one of our kids' abdomen. Now this is gross. I'm sharing it because you'll remember it. My wife and I had to fill that cavity with gauze every day. God, this was the highlight of my day. <laughs> Worse yet, at the end of the day, you had to take the gauze out. Then you had to stick more in there. The idea was, as the wound healed from the outside in, you'd need less gauze as you went through this process of disgustingness. And that's exactly what happened. It got to the end of the program there, and the, the wound had healed from the inside out. There was less need to fill that cavity. That's what it means to be in Christ. You have to heal from the inside out. These people in the Old Testament were outside-in healers. They would cover it over, put a, put a sling on it, put an ace bandage on it, put a cover it over, and Christ is saying to you this morning, and to me, listen, I want to cleanse your conscience, but I want you to heal you from the inside out. you got to get that first. That's what happens with the blood. If you're not in a personal relationship with Christ this morning, you're not a Christian, or you say you are, but you're really not. You're not in a personal relationship with Christ. You haven't accepted him as Lord of your life. You're not following him as he asks you to follow. If you're not there yet, you have no forgiveness of sins and you have a bleak future. Maybe today you'll accept him. But that having been said, you cannot actually reach your potential as a human being until you begin to heal from the inside out in Christ. Band-aids don't work. Promotions don't work. Jobs don't work. Status doesn't work. Automobiles doesn't work. Relationships don't work. Three or four husbands or wives don't work. A big house doesn't work. A membership doesn't work to a country club. Nothing works to satisfy outwardly what needs to be filled inwardly from the inside out. And as a result, you probably deep down in your soul, if you ever took that Band-Aid off, you'd realize, you know what, I'm not really satisfied. I don't know who this guy is talking to me right now, but he actually be reading my mail because he's right. I do have this sense of hollowness in my life. Well, that void is meant to be filled with a personal relationship with Christ. And this is why everything you seek to fill it ultimately will not do so. 
It is but a temporary solution. This outward kind of mentality we see in a teenager's life, to outwardly be accepted, to outwardly be identified, to be politically correct, to submit to peer pressure, always outside in type of thinking, never inside out. Man, if I, was, if I had the opportunity, I was thinking about this, uh, this earlier today. If I was a high school student who was born again, instead of me being born again and receiving Christ in my 20s, oh, what good I could have done. Last Sunday was my birthday and I received these birthday well wishes from literally hundreds of people, some of which way back into my past from high school days I hadn't talked to in 30 years, acknowledging like, I can't believe you're a preacher type comments. <laughs> like there must be a God. <laughs> this dude, is that really you or do you have a twin brother? Like, are you serious? Yeah. Oh, if I could have been brazen and bold and, and filled with the Holy Spirit in a high school days, oh, what good I could have done. Oh, the people I could have reached. But I put Band-Aids over that wound and I never acknowledged the wound existed. I left that hollow place in my life and never filled it with the very person who wanted me to fill it with himself more than anything else, Christ himself. And as a result, I just temporarily sought to fix what it was I needed fixed. Sometimes we pick words over washing. Now I'm gonna come right back at you here in the church. Sometimes your Christian walk can be more words than washing, going through the motions and the emotions, but not touching that place in your conscience that needs to be touched. Talk a mean, stinking game on the drop of a hat. But is it real? How's your walk? How's your walk? Can you tell someone what they want to hear, what they should hear, what you should be saying, and does it match up with your walk? How's your conscience? So here we are this morning in an operating room going forward into this passage, an operating room seeking for the word of God to penetrate even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. Here we are this morning in an operating room asking the spirit of God to individually touch that part of you that needs refreshing. Away we go. First Samuel 16 to seven, God is less interested in your outward appearance and more interested in your heart. Comes from David fighting Goliath. David knew that principle. Scripture goes on to say, how much more, how much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered much himself unblemished to God cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? How much more? Christ has to be seen as not one option, but the option. He has to be the supreme option. He has supremacy, authority, divinity, eternality, wisdom, lordship, reverence him. He has to be supreme. He holds all things together. And his, in his supremacy, he has to be seen as the one and only option to cleanse your conscience. For he has his blood is the only thing that can do it. And here we are spending the rest of our lives seemingly looking for something to give us some sort of sense of peace and cleanse our conscience that only one thing will do it, and that is his blood. He, unblemished, presented himself in his perfection and sinlessness and provided the very thing we needed to be applied to our conscience to give us a sense of liberty. All right, let's talk about that. He wants to cleanse your conscience. Let's define those two words, cleanse. He wants to purge. He wants to wipe clean your hard drive, your conscience. He wants to purge it. You ever um, make the mistake, I do this, I did it the other day, I ruined a pair of pants, ah, it's a bummer. I like the pants, they fit well. I played mediocre, mediocre golf in them and they were good, I liked them. But I went out on one of the million rainy days in the last 90 days and I played golf and I got mud all over the bottom of my pants, khakis, you know how that is, right? Then I made the unforgivable mistake of putting them in the washing machine. 
without treating them in any way. So now they've come out of the washing machine and the stain's still there, it's not coming out. That's it, they're done. Basically, they're good for shorts to paint in in the summer. You have to treat that stain with that goofy stuff you buy to put on there before you put it in the washing machine so when you pull it out of the washing machine, the stain's gone. Because once that stain gets in there, it's in there. Well, you and I are stained in our conscience in such a way that it's there for good and the only thing getting it out is the blood of Christ. No one talks about this. It needs to be eradicated from the very fiber of the way you feel, think, move, and have your being. In other words, there are some things in your conscience right now that have to be dealt with in this manner, for if they're not, it will continue to affect your relationships. I'll give you an example. The lepers come and Jesus heals them. And he says, go, go off to the priest, you know, that's in keeping with Leviticus 14, I think. Go off to the priest and, and show them that you've been healed and let them tell you and validate this healing so that you can go re-enter society. So if a guy was on a, on a wall of a city and he saw a leopard coming, he would say, unclean, unclean, unclean. Here comes an unclean person. Stay out of the way. Get out of here. We don't want you. But if Jesus healed them, they could re-enter society if the priest, if the priest declared them to be whole. The woman caught in the, with the issue of blood in the streets of Capernaum. We'll be going there in a month or so. And on the streets of Capernaum, there this woman was, healed of this incredibly 12-year disease, this infirmity. And he says, and he, he, he heals her, but he says, now you need to go to the priest. You need to go find out that inside you're clean. See, people are looking for outward cleanliness all the time. This fake Christianity, this hypocrisy, this facade, this mask that everything's okay. And then inwardly, they're rotten or rotting. Their conscience isn't matching up with what they see in their everyday life and in the scripture. How do you cleanse that? How do you reboot? Conscience is. A seared conscience is when you become, careful now, you become callous and insensitive to sin and unholiness. Now you see why this is so important a topic. When sin becomes blasé, when people in sin, you no longer hurt for them, that sin doesn't cause you an indignation you're allowed, you get licensed to hate one thing in this world. Iniquity. Take it. <laughs> it's the only thing you can hate. When a believer who's following Christ, their conscience begins to get seared. What is that? Like crispy, like over well done, like crusty, blackened, like black, blackened fish. It gets seared, and, and this happens to all of us because we immerse ourselves in a culture that calls sin not sin and we become unsensitive to unrighteousness. You see that? That's part of our conscience, and it needs to be cleansed. We see this in our own life and in other people's life. Jeremiah lamented over the sin of Jerusalem. Oh, it deeply hurt him. He, he was depressed over it. He wept over Jerusalem, as did Jesus. Lot was deeply troubled by the iniquity of Sodom and Gomorrah. Whatever happened to that? I'm not trying to enter into some legalistic diatribe. I'm telling you, whatever happened, if we could call time out and our conscience could be cleansed, we would see the indignation of sin of the 1950s. We would see the innocence of the 1950s. And we would see the debauchery of 2015. And they would be so diabolically opposed to one another. We, we have lost a sin consciousness in our country and in our personal lives. We are not sensitive to unholiness. And as a result, we're not sensitive to holiness. We've got to make sure we understand how do you apply such a thing to a person's conscience? This is why it's so important. This is a better way, a new and living way. The Holy Spirit grieves 
mourns, longs, travails over sin. If we're gonna sing the song, we need the Holy Spirit, then what we're really saying is, do we realize that we need a sensitivity, an indignation, a righteous anger towards sin? And we don't. We don't. This is not good. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, so that it may be benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were at, sealed the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Let me put it in another way. I'll come at this from every angle I can this morning. I know I'm, you ever heard this go through your mind? I know I'm forgiven, but I don't feel like it. I know what the Bible says, but I don't act like it. That's your conscience needing a scrub down. And that's my conscience needing a scrub down. Is it law or is it holy law? What are we doing? Are we easily differentiated from other people in the world who are not believers? We should stick out like a sore thumb, an indignation. Now, what happens is we get caught up in things. We, you know, some people here have done drugs and uh, have done drugs recently and some people here are still doing drugs. This is a fact in this room. We get so accustomed to doing something, we become sort of accepting. Well, we got the words, we got the rationalization, we have the procrastination that I'm gonna change this. We have all the justification we can possibly muster. We're killing ourselves. And in the process, we're selling ourselves that this isn't really happening. That's a seared conscience. Uh, we don't understand what we're doing to ourselves with the behavior that we do. We're totally unaware. That's a, that's a seared conscience. Um, take it to an extreme and you have a sociopath who goes into a community college with a gun and has little to no understanding what's right and what's wrong. Totally crispy, crunchy, seared, blackened conscience. Or a religious zealot who's out preaching some false doctrine, who would die on that sword, is, his conscience is seared. A, a preacher, a zealous preacher, preaching something other than the scripture, and so convinced it's important that people hear it, and totally contrary to the doctrine, his conscience is so unsensitive and so seared, he can't see the truth for the truth. Denominations right now are preaching doctrine and their conscience is seared. They can't see the sin that they're proliferating from the pulpit. It's unbelievable, but yet believable. His conscience has been seared. I'm diligently trying to finish my thesis, and I've discovered a, a strategy and a methodology through a lot of research on how to reach sexually active college students with the gospel. I finally feel like I put my finger on something that's actually gonna work in a young person's life who's out there looking at porn and sleeping with people of both genders all the time. And, I've proved, and I have proof that it works. But there's a certain contingent in my research that tells me there, you reach a point as a college student where you get so immersed in sexual promiscuity, you get so overwhelmed by ongoing exposure to pornography that you shut down spiritually and nothing affects you, nothing. You're seared, covered over, you might as well put the lid on it, nothing reaches that person. They shut down. And that's a large contingent of our population. And it seems like, how do you get through? Again, the blood of the lamb. First Timothy four, one through two, the spirit clearly says, then in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teaching has come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. All right, let's go on to something more positive. A cleansed conscience no long, not only condemns sin, and I want you to, before we move on, I want you to think about this. 
Are you as sensitive to sin as the Lord would like for you to be? Gary Hewins, pastor, preacher, are you as sensitive to sin as the Lord would like for you to be? And the answer is no. No. We collectively and individually and personally need a cleansed conscience by the blood of the Lamb. Why doesn't anyone talk about this? Not only does a cleansed conscience condemn sin, a cleansed conscience commends morality, commends it. The cleansing of the blood of the lamb puts our conscience in such a way that not only do we want to avoid sin, but we want to promote righteousness. Now, I have a theory, and it's just a theory. The reason so little evangelism takes place in the church anymore is we've lost a sensitivity to sin and the consequences of sin, and because we've done that, we've lost a burden for the people on whom we should share, with whom we should share the gospel because we're not taking into account their destiny. When you lose sensitivity to sin, you lose sensitivity to the consequences of sin. Now, how do we both condemn immorality and commend morality? Some of us have this, um, and it was planted in you and watered and put in, nice lamps were put on it so it would grow in your little mental greenhouse there over the years. Me too. That you're undervalued in your own mind that you're an underachiever, that you're unworthy, unsatisfied, unlovable, unclean, and worse yet, unchangeable. A cleansed conscience understands one's personal potential. A better way. You no longer have to walk around with a low self-esteem. You no longer have to walk in shame. You no longer have to walk with lingering guilt. You no, have, no longer have to walk with the insensitivity to both good and bad. You don't have to hang out in the blasé of life. You can enjoy the pinnacle of the mountaintop and still find joy in the valley. A cleansed conscience liberates us from the outside defining who we are. We live from the inside out. That's a clean conscience by the blood of the lamb. This is what, parents, really should be prayed over our children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews, neighbors, enemies, coworkers. This really is the deal. How we perceive God, how we perceive unrighteousness, how we perceive righteousness, and a desire in us to move towards one or the other or away from one or the other. The blood of the lamb. He cleanses our consciences from acts that lead to death. The acts that lead to death, um, the Greek there is actually useless rituals. Useless rituals. Religiosity. Repetitiveness, thinking something different will happen though I'm doing the same thing the same way at the same time all the time. Dead religion. We need this blood applied to our conscience. A spiritual solution to a spiritual problem. An intangible solution to an intangible issue. Nancy Reagan said, just say no to drugs. Put it on a grocery bag and everything will be okay. Really? Thank God she did that. You don't have a drug issue anymore with the grocery bag thing. A dead, empty, outward, superficial band-aid on a hemorrhaging issue of the inner part of the nation an inner part of a person. Cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. How much lack of service takes place for an increase in a feeling of unworthiness? 
So many could be serving in ministry, serving in church, evangelizing, leading, facilitating, coordinating. But for a lack of confidence, for a seared conscience, they can't freely serve the living God. I almost got caught in a trap that I know others are caught in now. Once you're in the church for a long time, in the same church for a long time, and you realize that you have so little understanding of the scripture that you can't interface with other believers on the subject because your inadequacy in the scripture and your biblical illiteracy will be exposed and you'll be so mortified and embarrassed. That's not freedom. That's not family. That's not vulnerability. That's not humility. That's covering a wound that really needs to heal from the inside out. Surely we're more accepting to one another than that. Yes, of course we are. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I don't know what else to say in the subject other than this, is the communicants come forward. We're gonna receive Holy Communion. This is all I know, and I, you know, this, I'm just gonna tell you what I know. It won't take long. I don't know much. There's some kind of vitally important transaction that has to happen by faith to surrender one's mind and expose one's mind to the blood of Christ in Holy Communion. It's, it's to where it's, you're ingesting something, it's going down your, your throat, but it's more than that. It's, it's a spiritual dynamic that says, Lord, apply this to my conscience that I might have a greater sensitivity to sin and I might commend that which is not sin and holy that I might avoid that which hurts me and I might pursue that which helps me, that I might hurt for those who hurt and carry their burden, but yet I might pursue you who releases all burdens, that I would not grow weary in well-doing. That's that, that, that transaction of the blood on my conscience that makes me look at myself as you see me, look at others as you see them. That's what it means to have a cleansed conscience, that I may freely serve him in any way possible, at any time, with any need of any gift, at any session of anything I ever put my hand to, I'm adequately equipped with a clear conscience to do what God called me to do. That's the priesthood of all believers. That's a high school student. Free to step away from that which defines everyone else in his life or her life and pursue a holy God who seeks to transform the very people that we are to be burdened for. If you don't care for those who are lost, that's a conscience issue. This is why apathy is the greatest enemy of the church. An absence of a love burden buried beneath shovelfuls of a seared conscience where sin is not as destructive as the Bible says it is and God is not as holy and necessary as I say. Seared conscience. I give you what I know about it right there. You do with it what you will before God as this meal comes your way. Something had to resonate with you this morning. What was it? And as you take these elements, you ask him about that. Oh, and brother, sister, ask him to apply that to your conscience. This is important.